We were always thinking about doing something together, so we came up with the idea that we wanted to look into the development in Accra, how things are going. And I was very, very sad to see that every year how Abochiman is getting smaller, smaller, and smaller. So she agreed to take on, on her to look into this. So Jürgen will tell you more details about what we went through and what we discovered. For me, the main point was, I don't want a Botiman to die. I want that village to stay. I want us to develop it. This is just a first step, putting your history in book, writing something about you. But I hope it's not going to stop there. I want us to develop something where you guys stay in charge of the property and money and your you can stay and stay there for all of us because East Legon need you. You are the heart of East Legon. All my people, all my dress, sewn, help. If I need some banana or whatsoever, there's where I go to get it. So it will be very, very sad for our area if you guys sell everything away and we have nothing. So please listen to what they have to say. Listen and see the value you have, we are not aware of. Um, we went to Abochiman, which is just a few uh, kilometers away from here. Um, a, a settlement in East Ligon to see what, to in a way to first find out what it is that we're actually looking at. So uh, we are here today um, in a sort of, a, a the conclusion of a first step uh, which is collected in this publication, East Ligon Passed Forward, which collects um, eight research projects by students of the uh, University in Vienna and the uh, students from KNUST in, Kuma in Kumasi. And there are representatives of the students here. There are representatives of the Abachiman community here. There are um, different um, experts and invited guests that have articles and texts in, in the publication here. I want to briefly also um, introduce this booklet um, that we've been working on. As, as mentioned, um, it um, collects these student projects which are mappings. Each student chose a topic uh, and investigated that in a two-week workshop. Um, interviewing people in Abochiman, uh, seeing and having their eyes open and ears in a way um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exercise in, in understanding a place. So you have these mapping projects and they have different, they go in different directions. Um, looking at spaces between buildings, how the street is activated, how open space works in Abochiman in comparison to what is around Abochiman, which is the East Ligon that um, we know when we drive through it in, in different areas, so the, the large houses and so on. So there is a, this contrast of East Ligon that is also communicated through this publication. So when we looked at East Ligon, our first question was like, is um, what we see here um, the consequence of urban sprawl or is it gentrification? So it was of real interest to us to understand the becoming of East Ligon um, with the uh, Abotziman village, so to say, as the heart of East Ligon. So um, our general questions were, as I mentioned already, urban sprawl, gentrification, land speculation, planning and lack of planning, demographic inequalities, economic pressure, but also like um, what um, the level of communal agency is in a situation like this. And last year I embarked on this research with AFA as well as um, other Ghanaian architects to explore the spatial paradigms of Abochiman. Um, and through that exploration, my, pro my research was focused on the history of the space and how it came to be. Um, the migratory practices that emerged within traveling to Abochiman or establishing Abochiman as a place. Um, 
and what that looks like now, right? And how that could inform where this space is heading in the future or how this space is being treated at the moment. What I am doing with my project is really questioning who defines development, who owns development, who, who is building our cities and who is defining them. It's not always the same thing. So um, it's really about revisiting the spaces that we have, looking at the fact that we have a physical city which tends to be imposed so that would be a lot of the structure, which a lot of is actually built on a framework that was never for us. So we look at that city and we understand that there's also the living city, which is the people, the reality. And then you also have what happens in between that, the interstitial, which I would um, not like to use the word informal for, but that's what we recognize as the informal. If you wanted to get to the ANC area, you just walk through the bushes. There were virtually no houses. Uh, you walk through the villages, through the bushes, till you get to your home, which was virtually uncompleted. So through the years, I've seen this place develop. And um, there's one thing that I've noticed is that suddenly, uh, I see that geographically, East Ligon is becoming the center, the commercial center of Accra. And that may be a theory that has yet to be proven. The idea was to really spend a lot of time in Abotsiman itself and to map it on diverse levels. And as you can see in this publication, there was, for example, Juliette, the French student, that she became very interested in looking at how women cook um, in the niches um, in Abotsiman, like outdoor but somehow protected. And then she compared it to the kitchens in these large villas around um, Abotsiman. And so it was, um, that was one example. Another um, person, uh, he um, beforehand looked at the development of, uh, or tri tried hard to find data on the development of East Ligon and worked in a digital manner. And then someone like Dominique would look at the past. And that was also like the title of, of the lab, like, um, calling it um, East Ligon Past Forward because it was very clear we cannot look at, uh, at the now only. We need to look at the past to, to understand what we, what we see and what is lived there. Yeah, I think w understanding a city is, I guess, no different to trying to understand anything which has multiple aspects to it to understand. So we, or the easiest way for me to try and explain this to people is think of multiple maps. The map that most people would have come into contact with, either a physical map that just describes the physical buildings and streets and things, that's one aspect of a map. But then what goes into making a place is also the people who are inhabitants, current, past, and, and, and future. And th you can start to map their mindsets and what they think and what they prefer and how they go about living their lives. Once you have good insight and good understanding of how are people currently living, then you can start to chart a, traje a trajectory um, that's slightly guided and it's the preferred community's option. So it's about uh, the theory of transformations. You know, how a place begins to transform if it's an empty space, you know, like Jungle Road, what starts first, uh, you know, what is initiated, uh, if it's houses, you know, and it's just residences, you know, how they just multiply over time and at what rate. But if you, a shop or some shopping center gets built at a particular point, and uh, the ANC becomes the central point of reference, commercial reference, for East Ligon, then other centrifugal factors begin to grow around it, like other commercial centers also begin to grow around it. And that's what happened to Jungle Avenue. So you will soon see that along the years, more shops began to grow and more conversion of houses, you know, into shops, you know, came about, you know, and those who couldn't you know, then of course the informal uh, 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 settlements which were within would produce people, mm, they, they, they 
actually become um, an integral part of the society in that they also supply something to the builders while they are building, you know, and to, let's say, the shopkeepers of East Ligon, which the workers are 120, you know, but they don't all eat in, a, in the restaurants, right? So there are uh, what you call eating places, chop bars for them to eat. And all these things are still uh, in, in existence. So it's about the transformations and the stages of transformations, what's new and what gets to vanish. Now, when it comes to places like Abuchima, right, it will be about at what point would we say Abuchima vanishes totally and is totally sold off to say high rises. And uh, in the theory I'm proposing, I think that that might not happen because there are cultural factors, sociological factors that are rooted in the indigenous spaces over there that will make it difficult for that to happen. So we are looking at the factors that would have that would uh, we have to consider if we are supposed to retain some of the indigenous spaces, as you said, to bring reference to uh, that part of that part of East Ligo. At the moment, what we see a lot is erasure. When you look at how spaces expand and grow, what is not set in concrete or in a manner that resembles an urban development framework that was possibly copied and pasted from elsewhere will then be discarded and then something will be sort of put in place and then we'll be told this is now a developed area. Unfortunately, in doing that, we then tend to marginalize the majority of the people who would be using those spaces. My question to them is always, but where are these people supposed to go? They form an integral part of the communities, the structures, even people living in mansions are using these markets. So this is a part of the city that we're supposed to be defining. But instead of that, when we want to say, you know, we're clearing up, we then sort of remove, as opposed to say, how do we resolve this in a better manner? How is it moving? How are, the, how are the people engaging? What do we see? What, you know, I mean, much of what you guys were doing with your mapping. How do we record those spaces? In recording those spaces, how do we articulate them? How are people defining the spaces they're living in? And then how do we express that? You know, you spoke about, for example, the naming of American House. If you look at maps, um, in your case, okay, you see American House on the map, but if you look at a lot of our maps today, they don't necessarily capture the reality on the ground. If you look at um, downtown Accra, and you look at where Movenpick is, and Makola is just round the corner from that, if you look at it in a map, it looks exactly the same. So how do we articulate that? And if you can articulate that, maybe if you're working with the communities and you're working with artists you can who are always sort of facilitators of dialogue, they are able to sort of mirror society as it stands. If you can create installations, if you can map the city on the city, so instead of creating a map and I go away with my map, why don't we sort of start mapping the city in the city? And if you're able to do that, you're creating installations that articulate what is on the ground and what is happening. And that then can start to inform how you're now moving forward with your development. Because if you have now articulated the needs of the people, because they have said, this is how it is, and this is what we do, and this is what we want, then you can start to say, okay, cool, we're moving in this direction because it is quite clear. And then that way your installations become an intervention. And so you start creating spaces which are actually reflecting the needs of the majority as opposed to just an isolated few. Um, artists as facilitators of dialogue, that's one uh, phrase you mentioned, I think. Um, now, Dominique, uh, you in your work, both um, as part of this project, but also as, as a part of a uh, limbo, you're working with, in also with, with artistic research and um, using spaces, reuse, re think, rethinking the use of spaces in the city. Um, could you talk about that? Um, so yeah, going off of what Namata spoke about, um, mapping the city on the city, that kind of um, ideology you know, resonates with the work of Limbo Accra, which is a project um, I created last year um, out of you know, the joint research with AFA as well as my thesis work um, in trying to examine and understand you know, the typology of the city of Accra. 
And in that process, um, I noticed there was like a surge of, you know, mansions and estates and, you know, commercial high-rise buildings being built. But in lieu of that, you know, a lot of um, buildings were left uncompleted. And in that, I also realized that, you know, there was a lack of spaces to do things, you know, um, to experience things differently outside of like this copy-paste method from the West, right? Um, and so since these uncompleted structures were there in abundance, um, you know, I created, I thought of the idea of utilizing them and activating them through art and kind of sparking this conversation on how, you know, we're designing our spaces, building our spaces, and how that's reflecting us. Um, so yeah, the activation took place last year, um, and it was quite successful in the sense that, you know, we engaged both the local environment as well as like the creative art scene here in Accra um, to kind of be in this space and, you know, have these conversations about what we're doing here, you know? Why is there so many uncompleted concrete structures lying around where we don't even have access to green parks and spaces or other alternative art spaces that we can enjoy and um, be around? So yeah, that's more or less the idea, um, kind of like, you know, identifying, you know, these kind of buildings around the city and finding ways, you know, to utilize them um, that suits the needs of, you know, the local given environment or just communities that are, you know, around in the city of Accra. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I hope you from our Bochi man still follow what's going on. Uh, I, I think we can only do something if you guys are ready to put your head together to say that, look, we want this to stop what's happening, or we want to develop something, and without you, no one can help you. It has to come from your community, it has to come from your, your chiefs, your members, and everyone who is involved in it. We are just trying now with this book to show you that you have a value, you are someone, we have written something down, a lot is happening there. I've been sort of obliquely involved with this project from afar. Um, and in fact, today when I was coming here, when I looked at the title, East Legon, Past Forward, I read it as Fast Forward. And I'm sure it's a, it's a deliberate um, intention. And I was thinking, well, how can we really fast forward these ideas in terms of a new vision? for not just the Bochiman, but for these struggling urban centers that had some significance originally. So my question is, how are we making sure that it's, it's accessible to people in their understanding and empowering them, understanding that they are also decision makers versus a case of um, ad advice sort of being seen as the maybe the only decision they can take? The procedure was like that there was an encounter through Rosemary um, with the Abatsiman community which was going through, through the whole year of 2018 and then in September 18 we did this let's say field research like that we would spend there two weeks on a da daily base and it was a very narrative approach for some who understood the language and for others it, it was like as I explained earlier but what I wanted to say is like that the end of this um, investigation at that time was like that we would display all the works in the community itself so we had a, an event on a Saturday where all the work was displayed dispersed in the community and there was a tour together with the authorities of the community and every single member who was interested and then we we discussed there and so we decided like now um, one year later to to focus a bit on the discourse and on the publication um, but there was this moment where it was a an encounter and a discussion in the community itself i mean i thank you for your comment because i mean it is very valid you know um, there's different things that are lost in translation when kind of um, wanting to state your attention um, whether how pure it is you know um, but we have been in close um, in direct contact with a lot of the community members, you know, and trying to like engage the different processes of what our results were from mapping the community. Just touching upon what 
other comments have been said um, this tonight. I think one of the things that um, has been quite defiant in that accessibility to this information, I think is really important outside of this event, outside of the book, um, but how language feeds into that, not just, I guess, the ling linguistics and dialects that are spoken within this community, but also the academics. And um, hearing your introductions at the very start was incredible, but you all come from very academic backgrounds. And I think about the communities who might not understand your practices and how you develop your practices and how that informs this program and this project. Um, so I think about that as well and how accessible language is from the academic point of view and how you're breaking it down to those communities who attend today or going forward or future events that happen as well. Um, outside of um, someone translating the conversation, I do think so definitely when it comes to um, this remit, this industry, how we break down from the tall skyscraper that you're seeing and your value and again, I really appreciate what you were saying about empowering people and thinking about how they have more value than of which they probably know, but also how do you define that through the language that you're using to them um, that doesn't put them in a space where you have that hierarchical situation where it's like I have all the knowledge and I'm telling you what you need as opposed to you tell us what, what, what we need and then we can kind of make it happen. I love that question and what the the project we started where we were trying to share information with everybody so that everyone can start uh, discussing the same thing, it started as Babel because nobody can really understand someone else's perspective truly. And so our whole job is just constantly, constantly making it as accessible as possible. It just It's never something that's completed. You just keep making it as accessible as possible. And there's one tiny example I always use of um, air quality is a big thing uh, globally at the moment, especially as we know th how detrimental it is to people's uh, quality of life, right? And so you can either tell people, this is the level of particulate matter in the air, everybody can go to sleep instantly, because no, that doesn't mean anything to anyone. Or you can show them how many days are they likely to lose from the average life, suddenly everyone sits up. And so it's all about translating everything from your right, everything is once you study in academia, it, it becomes very easy to just say the same thing as you learnt it, but that's part of this process where you are just constantly trying to refine that language so everyone can understand it. Um, I would also like to comment on, on that process, which for me was really non-academic. And it's really, um, maybe today, or I see it now in the in the response, it's a bit problematic that we didn't talk about like this setup last year more um, intensely, but what we really, um, how we really started, it was in a, it was, and that's what I tell my students always, it's all about listening and not about like imposing ideas. And it was really spending hours and days and weeks there looking and listening. And also the conversations there was, we also started um, from identifying spatial qualities or social qualities, such as we talked a lot about um, the power of trees and shadow. We talked about this um, wonderful, o the oldest house, which is a mud house, which is really magic and we, which should be preserved in some way. But, um, and then there is th um, Abdul who is here. He, he investigated um, the accessibility and also like, that land ownership is um, manifests very different, that there is a beautiful network of pathways and there's a amazing open spaces where p people s spend time and do their work and where kids can play in a protected manner. And that was all like what we, what we looked at. So we started really from a very phenomenological approach, but uh, super down to earth and non-academic.